social and cultural perspectives on violence. Um, quite a mouthful. So before I begin, I would just like to thank my mentors. Um, my primary research mentor um, is Dr. Bambi Chapin, and she is from the Department of Anthropology. Um, and she has just been an amazing mentor for me. I would not be the student that I am today. I would not have completed the kind of research that I never knew that I could without her. And even though she is technically on sabbatical this semester, we have kept in touch through phone calls, texts. She has dedicated so much of her time to me, so I'm infinitely grateful. Um, Dr. Kim Lisey, Vice President of Student Affairs, um, she's also the head of the Relationship Violence Prevention Advocates Group, which I have been a part of for many years now, and she actually helped inspire um, this project. Um, as well as Dr. Robert An Anderson um, from the Department of Psychology, um, I kind of call him my soul mentor because he always is, he's very interdisciplinary and has helped me pursue this topic and confirm it as my passion. And of course, Stephen McAffin, who is also another soul mentor who's known me for a long time. And without everyone's support, I would not be standing before you today. Thank you. So my topic is about intimate partner violence, or in other names, domestic violence, relationship violence, gender-based violence. And a lot of the time when people hear this, they get uncomfortable. And some statistics that I can present to make this a little bit more relevant is that one in four women in the United States, and consequently one in 10 men in the United States will experience intimate partner violence in their lifetime. Not only will they experience it, but they have reported um, short and long-term impacts of this violence. This can entail physical um, injuries or PTSD. And so another very interesting statistic that I would like to bring to the conversation is that 60% of Americans know a survivor of intimate partner violence. And that means more than half of us in this room know someone, is friends with someone, in a family with someone who is a survivor of intimate partner violence. And so a lot of this project in my INDS degree has been challenging this notion that intimate partner violence is a woman's issue, 
or it's an issue that stays in the family or is an issue that doesn't affect us because statistically it affects more than half of us in this room. So with that, my research question. Before I go um, talk about my research question, I would just like to say that it was inspired by my capstone and my, my, I mean my INDS degree, which focuses on intimate partner violence and what we can do to prevent it. And so for my capstone project, I wanted to learn about what are East Asian students' perspectives about healthy and unhealthy relationships and intervention resources at UNBC. And not only that, but how can we use this information to inform our outreach and messaging. And you will notice that I don't have the word violence in anywhere in this topic. And that's because violence can be in many different forms. But when we talk about intimate partner violence, recognizing that it happens within the context of intimate relationships. And so that's why I wanted to pursue a project that would help me get some insight into students' lives. So violence as a topic is already multifaceted and requires many disciplines to try to understand, and I use um, four main disciplinary perspectives for my project, both in looking at violence and also in terms of understanding how it relates with relationship dynamics. So I use anthropology, and you can see anthropology, there's a lot of um, qualitative research and the use of ethnographies, for example, that give us a more intimate um, look into people's lives. <coughs> Sociology, the social causes and influences of violence, um, gender women studies, particularly in feminist studies, which talks about things like rape culture, and in particular the experiences of women of color, which is inherently different than white women. Finally, psychology, which talks about the influences on the individual in terms of aggression, exposure to violence, etc. The primary methodology that I used um, for my project is person-centered interviewing, which is a qualitative approach that I, I take from anthropology, so that was my primary method. And so I interviewed um, five female students. I did get one male student, but for the purposes of this study, I'm leaving him out. And we would meet at a private location, and I would uh, record the interviews with a digital recorder, and then transcribe them. And then later, I would code the interviews after I was completing them to see what kind of interesting and reoccurring themes came up. So this is just the demographics of my participants. Um, you will notice that the, there are asterisks next to, next to these two participants, two and three, and that's just to note that these were students who had an East a had a parent who was not of East Asian background, and that was just interesting to note because I was not expecting that um, when I released my study. So the primary integration strategy that I used for this project um, is what Miller Boyd Fancy had described as just building complex and multi-causal explanations. So borrowing concepts and findings from a variety of disciplines like the ones that I just described for you to construct complex explanations of a phenom phenomenon, for example, violence. So this strategy was important for my study in terms of the kinds of questions that I thought to ask students, what kind of things that I could delve into, and furthermore, once I got into the analysis of my transcriptions, what kinds of things that I could look for. I just wanted to provide some context in which my research might, might fall into. And so intimate partner violence as a large scale issue. Um, this, we often look, for, look at statistics which come from the Centers for Disease Control. Um, and they do a national survey called the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey, which is nationally representative. Um, in addition, in recent years, the first report on the White House Task Force to protect students from sexual assault, that's just a long word to say, sexual assault experiences of students on college campuses, and that was funded by the White House. Um, in addition, just going more into the Asian community, I gained a lot of perspective from Dr. Yoshihana's and Chik Dabi's study in domestic violence in Asian communities, and that's just to note that um, while literature is out there and my search is in no way conclusive, it's interesting that there's very limited statistics about East Asian communities across the country and in general. So these are some of the main themes that came up within my interviews, and for the purposes of time, um, I might go into some more than others. So the first one is the clash of cultural models. And when I say cultural models, I mean kind of like the daily perceptions and activities that we do without really even thinking about it, our perceptions. And so 
This might not be surprising to many of you, but students reported that they often felt a clash of opinion and cultural models with their East Asian parents about topics related to relationships. So these are some of the things that we talked about and came up. And I say East Asian parents because interestingly enough, the student who did not have an East Asian mother was the anomaly for this situation. Another interesting theme that came up was the communication line. And what I mean by that is who talks to who about relationships and sex in the family. And what I found was that primarily it was mothers talking to daughters about this topic. And through this, um, mothers often communicated their expectations about dating. And some of the things that came up were things like dating after you finish your schooling, dating an ideal partner, which I will go into later, and um, the topic of sex, whether discussed explicitly or that is expected after marriage. And a lot, of the, a lot of the times this was told in passing, casually, or through storytelling about other relatives. And sometimes there were very explicit statements, most prominently about sex, such as, do not have sex. <laughs> and so this is a quick chart that I made um, about how students navigate restrictions that are placed on them in terms of relationships by their family. So some of these are hypothetical, but others who were in relationships or have been have told me that they would, from most secret, date completely in secret and not let their parents know, from most neutral, just choosing not to date, to the most open, in which they would be comfortable talking about not only relationships but sex and sex. So interestingly enough, again, the anomaly the participant with the, with the person, um, excuse me, um, who did not have an East Asian mother was the only participant who expressed comfort talking about not only relationships but also sex with her parents and primarily her mother. So while many students did not have um, extensive experiences with romantic relationships or were still in kind of current new relationships, they still had a lot of ideas about what they would want in an ideal partner. And this was interesting to note because as we talked about what are some of your ideas about an ideal partner for you? Um, some things that came up were humor, up to date on current events, race doesn't really matter. And, when, and then when I asked about what they perceived to be their parents' ideas about an ideal partner, the answers are very clearly different. They often mention things such as race preferences, um, an education, a STEM major being preferred, job stability, wealth, and success. Interestingly, when we talked about healthy and unhealthy relationship dynamics, um, the most interesting thing that I found through this was that often when we talked about unhealthy relationships, a lot of students brought up characteristics or traits that they um, described in their parents' relationships. I did not address this directly to the students as they spoke to me, but it was interesting to note that perhaps parents were serving kind of as an anti-model for students' behaviors. When we talked about resources in terms of what would you do if you were in a situation or a crisis in which you would need help, everyone, every one of the participants first said, I would go to my best friends. And this is significant because it shows us the importance of peer networks and also what would happen if students first go to their peers and what if their peers don't have the answers or don't have the resources themselves. Another interesting finding was that while almost all students said that they would not go to their parents when asked, they all listed worst case scenarios in which they said they would eventually go to their parents. And this is even more significant because it shows that while students, for their own reasons and for probably good reasons, would not talk to their parents about their intimate relationships and dynamics, they indicate that they would still trust to go to their parents as a stable place when they really needed help. Some of these worst case scenarios, interestingly, something that came up a lot was stalking. Um, and then another thing was physical violence. And that was the point where students said, I would go to my parents. These are the most um, commonly cited campus resources that students listed, the Women's Center, Green Dot, and Counseling Center. And these are some of the ways students also obtained information. So revisiting my research question again, so what do students think about healthy, unhealthy relationships and intervention resources? Where they go, do they know about them, and how can we use this? And so as I conclude, I wanted to put up my themes that I found, the main things that I found through my interviews, and also talk about some of the connections that it can have. So the first one I listed was parents as resources. So 
noting that in a lot of students' lives, parents are their number one resource. They're not fully independent, even emotionally, even emotionally when things, um, when there are issues, students indicated that in a worst case scenario, I would go to my parents. Um, limited communication between parents and students about student relationships. Commuter concerns, for example, in line with this, if, you, if your parents don't know you're dating someone and you're also living at home, kind of the barriers to getting resources and access there. In addition, the value on education on both parents and um, students end. So a lot of students talked about how they valued education. They're here to get their degree and to learn. And so maybe we can frame relationships as a way to support students in a time of high stress, such as college. And that can help in terms of putting that value on education in our outreach. As well as, again, recognizing peers as a very primary resource. And with that, I will end with potential um, topics that I could take with further research into this topic. And I look forward to seeing how we can serve this community better. Thank you. Um, I would be very curious to see if these kind of themes arise in just college students in general. Um, but I guess pulling from, again, gender and women's studies, that the experiences of women of color are unique. And I don't know if the themes that came up particularly are unique to East Asian students, but it would be interesting to see where things overlap and where things are particularly different. Yes? Did the larger surveys give you any context for us? Did they ask any questions that were similar so you could say, oh, okay, I see how this fits in, I, maybe not the UNBC right. context, but right. the larger national context? It's interesting because, for example, in the Centers for Disease Control, which does the national survey that we hear the statistics from, they don't include Asian American women in their demographic. So it's African, African um, men and women, Hispanic, and white. So even looking at that, that demographic wasn't even considered. So it's interesting. I haven't found much. Um, and the research that I have found was through specific um, kind of like nonprofits that do this kind of work with specific like Asian Pacific Islander domestic violence centers. That's where I've gotten the most rich resources. Yes? I wonder if you have seen any differences um, in families, uh, depending on how long the parents have been in the United States. Like if they were first, if the parents themselves had immigrated, or depending on how many generations they've been here, so how maybe much more they had been Americanized, and if that would make it easier for the kids to talk to their parents? Absolutely. I think that's a great point. Um, something that I couldn't really go into was just talking about um, more specific parent dynamics and from which countries and were they educated in the United States. There are differences that I noticed in students' responses. And some students even said things like, well, you know how Asian parents are. or And, and the students who brought that up um, seem to say the most about restrictions that their parents gave them. And other students who didn't have as many restrictions never brought up this idea of an Asian parent. So it's interesting. Mm -hmm. I just want to mention, good job for us all in front of you. Thank you. Um, I just want to mention that Asian parent thing, we literally just said that when we were sitting here, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Me and Eugen are both in this newsletter that INES just put out. We're like, our Asian parents are going to be so proud to see a concrete <laughs> example of us doing well in school. So it's like, that's that's super true. Yeah. You know, especially if you live through it. Yeah, it might, I mean, just kind of, I think one of the benefits of me having done the study is also learning about other people's experiences, which I was like, me too. Yeah. But also recognizing that just because there are similarities, it's not just restricted to an Asian community. And also the word Asia, Asian, is such a broad, diverse category. Um, and I also wanted to mention that this research is interesting because at UMBC, almost half of the minority enrollment since fall 2014 consists of Asian Americans. So it's very interesting how we can kind of navigate this and recognize that this is very relevant in our community. 
Time for one more. Anyone wants it? Oh, I noticed good. that you um, <laughs> that you uh, had three that three different sources on campus came up 